and um, we're slightly more electronics and software makers, but we are very fortunate to be joined by the um, project's aquaponics uh, specialist, Paolo. So um, any detailed questions about fish and the interactions going on in the system, are probably best referred to him. We're still learning about all of that stuff. <coughs> this is Paolo, aquaponics questions to him. <laughs> So um, we uh, run a small open source, mostly open source software and hardware company uh, based over in Sheffield. Um, and we try and work, uh, build systems um, based on, you know, web control, all the funky I.O. I'm not going to say it even. Um, but um, we're here really to talk about our aquaponics um, system. And um, for those of you who don't know, um, aquaponics is basically growing fish or prawns or something aquatic <coughs> together with vegetables. Um, and it's quite an exciting sort of way of growing and um, it's a closed sort of system. So apart from a few losses from evaporation and obviously inputs of food and sunlight, the water crucially just goes round and round. So um, this is the project that we've been working on. It's at London High School, and it's a spin-off project from Incredible Edible that are a yeah, kind of grassroots food growing project in Tumbledon. They've done a lot of good work, but a lot they're really interesting. At this particular project at the Incredible Apple Garden, they're trying out and researching cutting edge food production methods, and aquaponics is one of those, along with hydroponics and some soil based methods. Aquaponics requires careful monitoring and also they wanted to log data for future analysis. So they asked us to help them uh, decide what system to buy. And it turned out that there just wasn't anything on the market available that was less than 10 or 20 grand that, that could possibly do everything they wanted. So basically we took it upon ourselves to design and build our own system. And so, and um, this is the system that's um, in Todmorden now running. Um, and uh, one of the important decisions we had to make early on was whether to use a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. So we looked at quite a few different platforms, but only these two seem to have all of the variety of libraries we're going to need. Because we've got you know, 10 different sorts of sensors, we couldn't possibly write sort of low-level drivers for all of those sensing chips and so on. So I resolved the dilemma by uh, choosing them both. So um, some of the sensors connect, connect directly to the Arduino. Um, so we've got some water sensors and things like that. Sorry about this. Um, but um, some of the others connect to the Raspberry Pi. And we've also got some specialised sensors like pH and um, ORP, and they connect to a special shield, um, which you'll see in a second, um, called the Aqu Aquarium Ultra Shield. Um, and that's another open source um, shield we found. And it's only really by using open source that we had the possibility of making this, because we could just pull in all the different software and hardware components and the fact that the libraries were open, there was no licensing, you didn't even have to email anyone to get permission, we could just crack on with it and get going. So the Arduino um, has a lot of shields. So it, it works, but it's ended up a bit expensive and a bit ungainly, quite honestly. So this top shield is the um, Arduarium controller by um, Andrew of Practical Maker. Um, it's, as well as providing some uh, um, amplifiers for the very small pH readings, it brings out lots of the pins to convenient connectors. Um, then we've got an Ethernet shield, because we're linking the two devices by Ethernet um, and sending MQTT messages over that. Then we had a prototyping shield for more connectors. And then at the bottom, we've got the Arduino Mega, which we had to use because it had yet more pins. So uh, just a word about the Arduino codes that we're using on the system. We're using other people's code as much as we possibly can. So we had a, a slight problem because we wanted to, we 
wanted to have something that was the same code, the same interface for each type of sensor, so that it wasn't just a monolithic Arduino sketch. We wanted it to be a bit more plug and play in terms of software. But we didn't want to write everything from scratch. So what we ended up doing was writing happy classes. And you can see like there's the sensor, I've just, in, just had the um, .h file there, the sensor class, which is very simple interface that all the sensors have to provide. And then here's an example of a light sensor class. And I don't know if you can see, but it uses this Lux plug, which is somebody else's library. So we just wrote very lightweight wrappers around other people's code. And it is slightly different from your standard Arduino code because you tend to get these monolithic sketches. And for us, that's because we want the system to be very modular. We want to be able to add sensors, take things away. That works out to be better for us. And as a result, it is kind of a very simple framework. So if other people want to collaborate and add their own sensors, then so long as you provide that interface, then you know it's quite easy to hook it up to. Uh, the rest of the code. Uh, also on the software side, I wanted to talk about Mode Red a little bit and MQTT. The way the Pi receives MQTT messages from the Arduino, and we chose MQTT because it's very lightweight. If you've ever seen an HTTP header, you, you know, you, you get to scroll through screens a bit. Um, MQTT is much better for sending small pieces of data, which is what we're doing, we're just sending, this is the sensor that's doing the reading, and this is the reading, basically. We want to do that sometimes as much as every second. They aren't expensive, they're only about 13 quid or something. They'll give you an absolutely rock solid 3 amps at 5 volts, more than enough to power the Pi and the Arduino and all the sensors. And since then we've had very few sort of unexplained crashes. Um, we've also just recently um, got um, a battery-backed UPS because I don't know if any of you have been in Todmorden over the summer but apparently the whole town has had a, quite a series of power problems and, and even when the power does stay on it sometimes browns out quite a lot. So of course the UPS will help fill in those gaps. So um, yes, so the solution to the um, wired sensors problem was to go wireless. So um, we made a, we've got a range of wireless sensors now, and you can come have a look at them if you like. But um, basically, um, we got the battery life, which was the main thing I was worried about, up to about two years. I mean, we haven't had two years to test it, but based on the small amount it's been using so far. Um, and the reason that you can get two years out of a sensor is, of course, that you spend almost all of your time asleep. Um, just wake up, send data, go back to sleep again really quickly. And that's been another validation of our choice of MQTT because you've got the minimum overhead. You can wake up, send your data, go back to sleep in you know, 50 milliseconds or something. You know, and you'd be doing TCP and Wi-Fi handshaking for you know, 10 times that long. Uh, we've also added in a um, 3G dongle and so we've got text alerts um, straight from the device. Um, and backup connectivity, because um, if the internet goes down, of course, then you don't even get to hear about that. But, you know, um, we've also got power socket switching now, so um, rather than have to get into the whole messy and dangerous business of homemade electronics and mains electricity, just um, buy some cheap and cheerful remote control power switches from that thing, and you hack the remote control end. Um, and um, we're also logging to a database. Um, we've been through a couple of different options, including Redis. Um, we're currently using Cassandra, which I don't know if anyone knows, but um, is pretty hardcore um, and maybe a bit too rich for our blood. So we, uh, we asked a question on the IRC channel, and we were told, like, oh, two nodes is not typical deployment, you know. So um, we might uh, revisit that question, I'm not sure. happens to all this data, like we're logging it and then what, you know, we're reading all these sensors, what we're doing with this data. Well, there's two main things at the moment and one of them is this dashboard. The dashboard itself on the right, <coughs> we didn't do any of that design or any of that code really. We just took an open source project called freeboard.io, plugged it in and it worked immediately. It's really good, highly recommend it. The no dread code on the left is just to show how simple it is. 
to get a dashboard like that up and running. Um, on the left we've got all the MQTT messages coming in. Then we've got some rounding and adding some bits and pieces, adding some timestamps and stuff. It saves it in a buffer and then it just makes it available over the WebSocket and the dashboard comes and picks it off when it wants it. So nice and easy. The other thing, um, I've mentioned that data is also being logged to Cassandra. Well, that data in Cassandra is now made available over an open data API. Um, there's, there's more code running on the server which uses Node.js Express and it also uses this amazing open source thing called Swagger, swagger.wordnick.com and that allows you to embed documentation in your code so it's very similar to Javadoc and then you install the Swagger UI and the Swagger UI translates that generated JSON from the documentation and produces a web page that you can interact with so we'll give you the links at the end it'll be that easier for you to see it live but basically it gives you a web page that documents your API that you can also click and um, put in for example I want the airport current data from this state to this state and I want first time records press go and if you get the data that you expect then you know the API is working uh, yeah and this one as you see it's slash Tomberden the reason we've bothered to put Tomberden is we're hoping that in the future there will be other Epiphonic systems exposing their data in a similar way. So eventually we'll be able to collect that data with a unified API linking different systems. And that would allow for research into Epiphonic at a scale that I don't think has been done yet, at least certainly not openly. So um, we're giving away all this stuff, um, which is lovely, but um, you know, we still need to pay for beer and other essentials. <laughs> so, um, you know, how do we do that? Well, um, it's a question we're still working on, to be honest, but um, we basically, we're going to be following, or following a mixed model. So, uh, we're selling some of our stuff, you know, roll up, roll up, um, but we can't sell it for a huge amount of money because making stuff in the UK in small numbers is inevitably going to be five, ten times more expensive than you can buy it from China. So we're going to have to augment that with some support. Um, so we might um, collect people's data and give them a simple dashboard for free, but we might maybe do an alerting service on top for a small subscription or something like that. And um, as well as that, um, by getting systems to contribute their data together and pooling it, um, we'll be kind of curating this data set and that will hopefully put us in a position to be able to apply for some research grants and some other grants to support sort of open data and that sort of thing. So by mixing all these things together, we won't be relying on any one kind of plank and hopefully that will supply us with enough beer to keep us happy. Um, and of course, because this is an open project, uh, we need you. <laughs> Um, we, we've got quite a few gaps in our system that we'd like to fill. We're hoping that people here will either want to join in or know people that will want to join in. Um, if you're good at security and authentication, please you know, make yourself known to us afterwards. You wouldn't mind some help with the database. Um, I, having got the power consumption down so low with these things, I think uh, it's possible that we could have a solar cell on top and even indoors harvest enough energy to just keep the things going forever. So you'd never have to worry about batteries, you wouldn't have to charge them, you wouldn't have to you know, have the environmental impact of batteries and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and of course the wireless um, sensors also give a great decoupling point. Um, and because the base station is based on a Raspberry Pi, it's very cheap, we could quite conceivably have multiple base stations for redundancy and multiple sensors for redundancy. And then if any one element of the system suffers a crash, it could just carry on. So, um, yeah, if you know things about Quorum and um, those sorts of, you know, overlay file systems, then again, I can't... And uh, your ideas as well. Um, I mean, so far, we've, we're working in, a, in an aquaponics context, but a lot of this stuff could carry over to home monitoring, environmental monitoring, various sorts of monitoring. Um, so your ideas would help sort of us extend these projects. Through. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, oh yeah, we're doing a workshop tomorrow. Um, so, um, we've got a couple of different things and you can play with either or both of them. Um, we've got a boatload of sensors, um, temperature, pressure, heartbeat that one is, current monitoring, all kinds of things like that. So, if you've got ideally a Raspberry Pi or something else, come along, we can help you connect up sensors and read the data and then do something with it, maybe talk to an app or, or one of those dashboards, for example. And we've also yeah, we've also got um, obviously the the API. So if you're interested in using that data, it is a little bit sketchy because we've been recording it over the last few months, and we've had the odd issues here and there. But you know, there's quite a lot of data there, and if you're interested in developing like a mobile app or a web app or anything like that, then that could be another thing to do at the workshop. So it's hardware or software, really, whatever you're most interested in. Just a few links then, so uh, the top one is just our blog, where we, Gareth especially has written a lot about the sorts of things we've been talking about today. Um, there's the link there for the dashboard, the API, we've got a little app where you can download the data as CSV. Yeah, we, um, we've entered the Hackaday Prize, so if anyone's um, following that, um, please come and find us and vote for us, and we'll go to space. <laughs> yeah, then uh, we're Layer Zero Labs on GitHub, we've got all our code up there. I'm afraid the documentation is all a little bit possibly lacking. There's some readmes that might be a little bit out of date because we're working really, really fast, so we can't always keep up with ourselves. So if you want to download our code and look at it, which would be really grateful for any feedback, and you found the documentation lacking, just drop us an email. We're very happy to get emails at info at l0l.org.uk. But if you're interested in particularly in the aquaponics, then that's a collaboration that we're doing with Paolo, and that's called aquaponicslab.org. We're going to hand out some cards, but um, that's our address there. So I don't know if this is going to be put on the web, because all these links are a bit long to copy. But, yeah, we'll yeah. make the slides available. Okay. So, um, yeah, any questions?